All right, we're live. Happy Monday to everyone out there in digital marketing land. <laughs> uh, I'll be your host, John Moran with Solutions 8, and today is our Monday at 9.30 a.m. Pacific time, Ask Me Anything. Uh, so this is where we go live and people can join and we uh, we kind of have a, a city stream of folks that uh, that come on that, that we've been we've been helping kind of week over week. So this is the time that I'll be going live for you know half hour, forty five minutes, um, just to have any questions answered, and anything that uh, you all need any help with. Um, I think we've been able to to help a few few people so far, which has been great. Um, I'll get some some Facebook comments or some emails that are saying like, "Yep, I I did what you said, and now it's working good." And, uh, even some people from the three X shopping fire start to see, uh, some really, really good results. So that's, that's always exciting and encouraging. <clears throat> I'm going to take some water here. Got to drink a lot of water here in the desert, especially when it's going to be about like a hundred degrees this week. And <laughs> yeah, you don't have a gallon of water on you. You're in trouble. All right. So I see some people starting to come in now. Um, yeah, this is that awkward time where you get to just watch me talk to myself for a little bit until some questions start coming in. <laughs> um, there's uh, some kind of updates for uh, the Google ad land, uh, Google ads, um, and something I'm going to be looking into today uh, has announced several new smart bidding features. Um, new smart bidding features are top signals and seasonality. Uh, and when to implement maximized conversion value bidding recommendations. So again, this is going to be um, it's going to be something that Google has been trying to trying to push more and more as the recommendations tab. In my opinion, a lot of the recommendations tab, I would say probably seventy percent of them are just not something that you should follow just yet. Um, the recommendation tab, think about it as we are the test subjects. <laughs> for their automations, which is is good because a lot of their automations have come a long way. Their automated bidding strategies, you know, two years ago, I would not recommend pretty much half of them. And now they're they're pretty, pretty viable. Uh, a lot of the automated bidding strategies are working really, really well. And because, you know, people, you know, like like us and like you and everyone have been have been kind of testing them and, and sending them signals essentially as to, you know, what works, what doesn't. Um, and then just make sure that, you know, your conversion actions are proper. So this way, you know they can get some good data, but um, yeah, it's uh the new new smart bidding features are going to be pretty cool. I'll be probably making a, a video about that today, uh, or Casa might be, <clears throat> and we'll kind of discuss what those new features are. Oh. Uh, Walid, hey Walid, uh, your thoughts on smart shop smart campaigns versus manual campaigns for starting new ad accounts? So before we usually would start just manual campaigns. Depends on if you're running e-commerce or if you're running uh, lead generation. Uh, and Walid, could you let me know? if it's e-commerce or lead generation, because I have actually two different schools of thoughts. So I'll just kind of go through go through now. Um, smart campaigns for e-commerce, I like, uh, in the new accounts. Smart campaigns for lead generation, I do not. The reason being that smart, sh smart campaigns like smart shopping, uh, smart shopping is, I think, good because you don't have to, uh, you don't have to depend on lead quality. Uh, so using like target CPA and and kind of pure broad search terms, not phrase match or exact match, broad match, modify, which is going away, but just pure broad. Um, I like those uh, for e-commerce because you don't have to worry about lead quality. They either buy or they don't buy. I, you know, lead quality is depicted on if they purchase. Um, the ones that I don't like, uh, I don't like any kind of smart campaigns like smart display. I don't really like those. Uh, I don't like, um, I, I like local campaigns when you're running them in addition to other campaigns that are like a keyword strategy. Um, the reason why I like smart shopping for e-commerce, yep, and while well, you say e-commerce, okay, the reason why I like smart shopping for e-commerce is it's going to start remarketing your existing traffic if you have any. So your direct, your organic, your social, um, your email traffic, all of that traffic, it's going to start to remarket them and it's going to learn. Um, my recommendation though is running smart shopping in addition to other campaigns when it's new. <clears throat> if you have a new account, new business, new brand, run a dynamic search ad, run a brand campaign, run a uh, smart shopping campaign, <clears throat> run a dynamic remarketing campaign, um, run multiple different campaigns that are going to help smart shopping. Um, maybe stay away from YouTube and display just off the bat because those are kind of lesser quality, um, uh, not lesser quality. They're more top of funnel, middle of the funnel, but running a DSA is really good. A brand campaign will tell smart shopping these are the type of people that buy because those are usually where your easy conversions are going to come from. Running a search campaign with some really targeted small amount of keywords is going to say these are people, um, what they look like, 
what actions they take, what they search, where they've gone before. Anytime you can feed smart shopping other campaigns, which means smart shopping looks at everything, <clears throat> looks at all your traffic. So if you already, if you can build other campaigns and you start to see conversions come in, you can even run a standard shopping campaign at the same time as a smart shopping campaign. Um, so maybe help it learn faster. And when you run a standard shopping and a smart shopping at the same time, and your standard shopping is going to be here, your smart shopping is going to be here in terms of uh, volume. And then all of a sudden it's just going to do this. It's going to kind of teeter totter. And all of a sudden smart shopping is going to be taking over and standard shopping just simply won't run more than like one or two clicks a day. And when that happens, smart shopping knows enough about the people to say, I got it from here and kind of take over. So run smart shopping from the beginning, leave a ROAS goal off, do other supplemental campaigns that teach smart shopping. These are the people that come to my website and buy. And then smart shopping will become your main campaign. And you can start to either lean, uh, wean yourself off of the other campaigns or keep them running lower. Or if they're having good success, run them in addition to smart shopping at a very high level. I have a couple of campaigns that the search campaign outperforms the smart shopping campaign. Um, but the smart shopping campaign spends $1,200 a day. And then the search campaign spends like $2,500 a day. So they're very viable to run together. Uh, Shahid, hi, John. Uh, what's your recommendation for DSA campaigns when you have a large number of SKUs in terms of your, your rules? So what I usually like to do is set up ad groups inside of DSA uh, based on, just depends on a categorical topic of your of your product. So we have one company that sells hair care. They have shampoos, they have conditioner, they have uh, face masks, they have um, uh, what spe one specifically for curl, curly hair. Um, the more granular you can get in your ad groups on DSA, and then either target categories or target the URLs. And the more granular you can get your DSA campaign, you can actually set a, and I did a video about this, I think a couple weeks ago, you can actually set a target CPA based on each one of those ad groups. So if you want to separate them out and give it a specific uh, cost per acquisition for each type of category, like I know that these group of products or this brand or whatever it may be, uh, I need to make X uh, and my average cart value is Y, then just take your average cart value divided by four and that's your target CPA and that's a 400 row as in that ad group. So I would break them out by ad group and DSA, use target CPA, set the, the target CPA by the ad group, make sure the ad group is defined, uh, I guess, definitively enough to be different than the other um, other products. I usually like to use URL um, rules. I don't usually like to do categories because sometimes you'll overlap and then you'll share um, categories uh, with other ad, ad groups. So try to do uh, URL rules and then set your URL rules to a specific dynamic ad targets. And then in that ad group, use target CPA because you can set target CPA not campaign wide, you can set it ad group wide. This way you can kind of control your costs and your volume based on your ad group. So that's what I would recommend. Michael, uh, can you recommend any affordable Shopify developers that your agency has uh, maybe used or recommended in the past? Um, I, I can. Um, his name's Donna. She uh, owns a company called Admex Tech. Um, and I think, Michael, uh, you and I have been emailing, I think. Uh, let me just make sure it's you. I'm sorry, I have a kind of a, an odd memory um, for this. Let me just see here. If, if we have, just let me know. As I think uh, it was either you or possibly another Michael. Um, but if we haven't, let me know. Uh, I'll drop my email here. Um, let's see here. Uh, Michael, if we have, I'm just going to put... Uh, There we go. Yeah, that worked. Uh, that's my email. Um, okay, it might be another Michael. Yeah, I just put my email there. Uh, shoot me an email. I'll do an intro to Donish. Um, Donish is he actually was a uh, employee of Solutions Eight for for some time, and so he ended up um, going off and and developing his own agency. We actually outsource things to him, uh, and he's he's someone that I highly recommend. He's very cost effective. Now he is um, he's in Pakistan. So there's going to be a time difference of about 12 hours. But um, so if you email, you know, like two o'clock our time in the, in the States it might be 2 a.m. his time, depending upon where you are. Uh, so just make sure that you know that there's that time difference and then it might take a little while to get back to you. Um, but usually gets back to you obviously within the same day. But uh, he's done some work uh, for our Shopify uh, sites that we had for our clients, stuff for that Cosmo and I have done ourselves. Um, and so depending upon what you need, uh, he's not a Shopify specific developer, but he's very, very good. And he has a team of people that work with him. So uh, that's what I recommend. So go ahead and shoot me an email. I'll do an email intro for you. Uh, let's see, Sam, I've, uh, hi, John, been waiting for an hour now. Oh, <laughs> uh, cool. I'll hopefully, uh, 
hopefully it's, it should be should be you'll get a good amount of information out of this uh yeah michael think it's another uh Waleed, awesome thing yeah Waleed, let me know um let me know uh if you you know come back each week and let me know how everything's going and we'll, we'll kind of work through stuff sam how can i grow traffic for a dietitian service is usually diet plans for weight loss how to go about this his competitors are already running search and display okay so dietitian if you're talking about local i would definitely run a local campaign um, local campaigns, make sure he's got a Google My Business or she's got a Google My Business. Make sure that that's added as a location extension. Run a local campaign. Um, eventually, what's going to happen is, uh, we did a video about this. I think it's coming out this week. It's called, um, we do a uh, industry specific video. We actually touched upon local businesses, but I would run a local campaign. Local campaigns are going to put them in a very good map placement. It's actually going to do you know, YouTube placements, not with video, but links. Um, it's going to do display traffic. It's going to do search. Local campaigns are really good for a localized business. Now, you can't set your um, ad schedule, so it's going to run 24-7, and you can't set keywords. It's going to basically interpret your the dietitian's business based on the Google My Business Center website and then place them in a very localized search. I would definitely run a competitive campaign. Uh, so target each one of their competitors and make sure that you set your call from ads uh duration for the conversion maybe two and a half three minutes set it fairly high don't use the default of 60 seconds that counts the calls from ads as conversion um set it higher because as a competitive campaign you're going to probably get a lot of calls for hey is this you know abc company oh no this is a different company oh i'm sorry and then hang up so you don't want to count those as conversions but you can local campaigns for those we we use competitive ads a lot uh competitive ads can be very very good Next thing that I would do is absolutely run a DSA campaign. Dynamic search ads to a localized area help a lot um, because you're going to have people that are looking for a lot of different um, type of type of searches, and your keyword strategy on your search campaign may not be 100% uh, accurate yet. So run a DSA campaign, and it's safe because you're going to run in probably you know 10, 15, 20 mile radius. DSA will share with you all of the search terms that match what the company or what they're looking for that company about. Think of it like instantaneous SEO. So running a DSA campaign on a very localized campaign will tell you, hey, when people are searching for this, this is what you're ranking for. And when people are searching for this, this is what's going to, going to bring those bring those people to the site. So make sure that the DSA campaign is, um, is set up. But also, my opinion, uh, set a dynamic ad target for the blog. Because the blog, usually, you're going to write about a whole bunch of different things. You want DSA getting you to the top of the search list for random keywords that are in your blog. So set dynamic, negative dynamic ad targets to the blog. And then run a small search campaign uh, targeting, like let's say, five keywords, but in broad. And then use target CPA to make sure that you're not blowing out your budget. Because what's going to happen is you're going to have you know dietitian, <laughs> dietitian near me, best dietitian, local dietitian, top review dietitian, um, be very specific. Um, and maybe not even just the word dietitian, do like dietitian near me, um, hire dietitian, local dietitian, and use very, very bottom of the funnel keywords in broad, but only use about five to start with. Use target CPA and what target CPA with pure broad on those five keywords is going to do is going to match you to like a thousand different, different search terms. It's Google's new way of basically ignoring match types anyway. That's going to happen no matter what. Uh, it kind of ignores phrase and exact match, but it's going to share with you all of the ways that the people are searching for it, for that. And then your your safety net is that target CPA. I don't want to pay over you know, $25, $35, 40 for a conversion. If you can, run call rails or call tracking metrics. Listen to the calls. Uh, that's super important. Um, we listen to every single phone call that comes in for every single one of our clients. And if you're not listening for those phone calls, you're possibly going to have a disconnect between, yeah, I see all these leads coming in. And the clients say, well, I don't actually see those leads here. Um, then when you hear the calls, it's just not the right type of lead based on those keywords. So run call track metrics or call rails if you can. Uh, that's going to be that's gonna be paramount to having a localized campaign running really, really well. Um, and then remember your remarketing. Remarketing is going to be huge, especially local. Dietitians, people are going to look for like four, five, six, seven dietitians. So make sure running remarketing and run an RLSA, remarket list for search ads. Put out like a 40% bid adjustment because it's local, so it's safe. Um, a positive 40% bid adjustment. So running remarketing at high level is going to make sure that if they have a four, five, six day, you know, um, sales cycle uh, from point of search to point of lead, uh, that's going to be, it's going to be helpful to get them back in the door. So let me know if that makes sense for you. Uh, Mike, hi, John. Uh, any recommendations for high conversion rates on e-com product pages, uh, apparel? Um, I'm, I'm guessing you're saying like anything for um, Mike, Mike Harry to 
help convert like CRO, like conversion rate optimization recommendations, please let me know if I'm right. Uh, and we're not talking about Google ads, we're talking about the, on the website. Let me know if that's that's good. Uh, Michael Johnson, I'm on the fence for Masterclass. Part of my hesitation is that I have a lot of experience with Google ads. So I think the first four days mostly review stuff for me. So I'm guessing, uh, so I guess I'm wondering how in depth the five, eight, it's gonna be, it's gonna be in depth. Um, if you have a lot of experience though, you might not learn, you might learn a couple things that are new. They're not going to be, um, I mean, if you're, if you're, you know, have a lot of that, uh, that experience, you might find the same, like, yeah, I kind of already knew this stuff. So, um, my opinion is my, if, uh, Michael, if you haven't watch our YouTube videos, um, just, you know, pick, you know, random 10. Uh, and if you don't find value in those 10, you might not find value in the masterclass. Um, our YouTube, YouTube channel, uh, especially if you look at some of my videos, we, I go into like super deep in terms of, you know, um, um, in, in terms of anything Google ad related. And there's some tidbits in there that, that are just like, aha, like mine, uh, like openers. I think, you know, last week or week before we did the, uh, Southwest jewelry buyers, um, or maybe, no, it was in the, it was in the three shop. We did the Southwest jewelry buyers, I think, um, where, you know, taking 60,000 keywords, streaming to 30, all of a sudden dropped, you know, the cost per conversion by 75%. Um, but the other things are like, you know, what bidding strategy is going to be working with what attribution models and when, um, so those are like the, the kind of the, you know, if you're using you know, time decay and you're using a target CPA or target ROAS and when to set those up properly so that you're not stealing attribution and possibly tanking the campaign on accident. Um, you know, those are, those are things that I think that we'll, we're going to go through, but we're, if we usually have like a five to 10 day build out time, just depending upon the campaign and we're going to do everything. Uh, we're going to take down an instance of call tracking metrics. We're going to install it. We're going to create the script. We're going to install the script in Google ads. We're going to show how a call comes in and call track metrics, how it dynamically rolls on the page for every single phone call to be recorded and how to import that back into Google ads using uh, a template for GCLID. Um, so we're going to do everything that we would do if you would hire us. Um, <clears throat> so if you're interested in seeing like literally the step-by-step -step that we would do and how we test it and make test purchases instead of analytics and do all that kind of stuff, uh, it might be, might be good for you. But if you say, Hey, I know, 90% of that you might, you know, spend the money to maybe learn one or two things. It might not be worth it for you, honestly. Um, check out our YouTube channel. If you say, Hey man, like when you really dive deep in, into like some of these, some of these videos, uh, and I've learned a couple of things, that's, that's what the master class is going to be. So I can't really know exactly your level of, of, uh, knowledge. I I'm assuming it's high. And so that's why I'm saying maybe caution it. Um, you know, we're not, we're not here to be like, yeah, buy it today. It's going to be great. You're going to make millions. You might not really, you might not really get a lot out of it. So maybe you may hang tight and, and, just come to the Monday class and, um, or my, sorry, the Monday lives. And if you say, yeah, you know, I, I keep finding little tidbits or here and there, it might be worth it for you. We're not, it's not going away anytime soon. Um, so that master class is going to be something I think you can even purchase afterwards. If, if you just say, Hey, you've decided, you know, two months from now to, to take the, take the plunge. Um, I'll be in limb. I apologize if I, <laughs> if I mess up anybody's names, my name's John. It's uh, it's like the one syllable It's super easy. So I'm not very cultured. Uh, so if I mess up your name, my apologies. Uh, Alvin, uh, hi, John, do you have any strategy running discovery campaign with in-market audience for e-commerce store? So I, I'm not a big in-market audience person. I'm actually a DSK and I've spent, um, I spent about $75,000 in two weeks, uh, testing different strategies and, uh, it was for, uh, Pedro Rodeau. And we found that every single time, whether it's discovery, whether it's YouTube or display DSK for whatever reason, outperformed, um, outperformed even custom audiences and in market audiences fairly quickly, even topics, <laughs> surprisingly topics, even outperformed in market audience in market used to be my go-to, uh, DSK uh, display search keywords are technically going away. Uh, but they've been going away for like a year now and they haven't, and I still use them and they work better. So my opinion is if you're going to run a dis discovery campaign, just be prepared to have a lot of clicks, but not a lot of activity because discovery is now Gmail as well. Gmail ads have a 50 to 60% click through rate, but that technically just means opening up the Gmail, not clicking to the website. So that's a very big distinction you have to be aware of. Your discovery campaign might have a thousand clicks, but then analytics will say that you actually only had 65 visits. That's because now that Gmail is part of discovery and discovery uh, and Gmail gets opened a lot, you're paying for those opens, but if they don't click to the site, 
that's what happens. So cautious yourself, caution yourself with discovery. My opinion is use uh, display search keywords and use the same keywords that are performing in your search campaign. So you have a search campaign, let's say four or five keywords are working really, really well. Start with those is display search keywords in discovery. That's my opinion. Um, uh, David, John, my bro, which campaigns do you use to feed your smart shopping? Everyone. <laughs> so if my, uh, when I'm running a smart shopping campaign, I'll always run a brand, a competitor, a DSA, a search. I'll actually also run a dynamic remarketing at the same time. And I have a video about that called like the perfect remarketing. Um, and then, so it's search display. Um, sorry, it's a, it's a, it's a brand, it's a competitor. It is a DSA. It is remarketing. I, I'd run pretty much everything, YouTube and display uh, with DSK keywords. Run them at a low level though, uh, but I, I literally run everything. Um, every single thing is gonna help smart shopping and whatever. And this is one of the parts of the master classes, depending upon what you're running. If you're running a brand, if you're running a um, dynamic remarketing, keep it on low budget, like $5 a day, $10 a day maybe, and especially to start. Um, when you're running a competitor campaign, run a competitor campaign, again, on lower budget. When you run a uh, DSK YouTube, when you run a DSK display, again, keep those on lower budget. Everything I have outside of my my smart shopping and my main search campaign are all really low budget and usually about one fifth of the smart shopping in the in the uh display the reason is when you have youtube when you have display when you have those other campaigns when you have a discovery campaign i don't use discovery actually um i use discovery for really top of the funnel free like lead magnet type of campaigns but i don't run it for any sort of roas or or or, or good cpa ones but what i would say is run a uh, run all the campaigns but on a much lower budget except for the general campaign that that general campaign i usually use that at about 50 to 75 percent of my smart shopping campaign because when you have a youtube campaign and in a dsk uh display campaign as an example those are going to start getting a lot of impressions and a lot of clicks but then smart shopping is going to take it over from the after that visit and then try to remarket to them and the dsk youtube uh, and dsk display look like they perform poorly they don't I can track this down to the day that the campaign started though. When you look at the daily spends of your smart shopping campaign that are just average and you start DSK and YouTube, all of a sudden your daily spends and the smart shopping impressions and clicks will start to double in a very short period of time. And that's because it's starting to remarket all the people that you're capturing for your top of funnel traffic. And usually your smart shopping campaign will be able to scale faster even though your other campaigns are failing because they'll have like four, like five, row as no, no like four percent like spending 100 bucks making four dollars but it's feeding the other campaigns the reason why i keep them low though is because i don't want to take all of my profitability that i'm now gaining in my smart shopping and just throw it out right out the window um in the row as column of my camp of my account so run everything test everything and that's what we do in our when we start a campaign is we'll build six or seven campaigns um and that will help smart shopping learn quickly and then become my main campaign and the other ones just continually feed it with top of the funnel traffic or bottom of the funnel um, traffic like search campaign that is really relevant. Just remember, Google runs on clicks. And what I mean by that is if you get a 40% watch rate and you get 10,000 impressions on YouTube, you may only get 100 clicks. 100 clicks in YouTube is just like 100 clicks on any other channel. Just because you had 10,000 people watch your video doesn't mean that Google is going to understand all of those people, especially if you're running bumper ads and non-skippables. It doesn't really send Google any signals because they didn't take the action they had to watch it. <clears throat> so when you're running up other supplemental campaigns, keep them low budget. Smart shopping is going to steal attribution. And sometimes even with time decay or linear or position based or data driven, it won't actually give the credit um, to those campaigns. Um, Google actually now has your view through conversions kind of be defaulted into the all conversion tabs, not just the conversion, but the all conversions. So you can watch your, 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 um, uh, uh, um, what's it called? you're going to see your view through conversions in a different column now. Um, and so because of that, I run them on low budget until I can see viability, uh, see how they're actually impacting the smart shopping campaign. And when it does, then I start to crank those up, but balance, balance the, the profitability and, and the learning campaigns. Kind of think of them like sacrificial campaigns. You need them, but don't say, hey, oh, I spent five grand and made 10. And then I put like five grand in the search or sorry, five grand in the display. So just make sure you're balancing those really well. Uh, uh, on the 30 minute one-on-one -on -one call with Mike and Joan, they said I can advertise my digital products, but there are some caveats workarounds needed. Uh, can you expand upon that at all? Yes, Michael. So 
Google hasn't actually come out and give an official statement. Yeah. What they did say is that you can run digital products. Uh, you have to set your default shipping to zero. Um, and that we can do that with like data watch or something. So you can set your, 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 um, your shipping to zero it has to be like zero. It just can't be like blank. It has to be zero. Um, but you are, you're going to be able to run your digital products. We do have a client, a couple of clients right now that we do run digital products. Sometimes you get disapprovals. Um, that's because Google doesn't have an actual real, um, uh, real, I guess, official statement. It used to be only tangible products has to be something that can be boxed up and shipped. Uh, now they say, Oh, okay, well, yeah, you can run digital products now in smart shopping. Um, and it, it will run. Uh, there's it, the only reason why there's some caveats is because we've followed all the rules and even Google themselves or whatever on a call with them saying, why is it running? They're like, mm, we're not sure it should be, uh, let me get back to you. So we usually like to say like, we might run into a couple issues just because I pop me personally. I think some of the algorithms or, or some of the, the automated kind of disapprovals are still not evolving with Google's. Yeah, you can run them now type of issue. Um, the biggest one was just that shipping thing had to be marked at zero. Uh, and sometimes if you have a recurring subscription, those can sometimes get a little bit wonky. I don't know why, but recurring subscriptions sometimes just, just have issues instead of, instead of Google ads where we're kind of in a funny transition between no, it's completely banned to, okay, now you can, it just hasn't been a smooth transition to, okay, now you can, we had some, we have, we have two clients right now that we run digital products with, and we have no issues with them, but it doesn't mean we're not going to run into issues in the future. Um, and so that's, that's the best I can say is we're kind of at the mercy of whatever Google is being okay with that day. Um, so, uh, the caveat was just, you know, sometimes recurring subscriptions get disapproved. Um, because that was a big no, no, but now it is okay. And they actually have now literature that says it's okay. Um, and then just that shipping issue. Uh, sometimes if your website defaults to some sort of shipping value, but you put zero in the feed, um, but Shopify just like defaults to like a weight based shipping, then those two will combat with each other. And then you're going to get a disapproval, possibly suspension in Google Merchant Center. So nothing we can't work through. There just will be some hiccups along the way. I can pretty much, I can almost guarantee you that. So that's kind of like the, the bad part. Uh, Stan, thank you so much, John. Yep, uh, Mike, yes, CRO on site. So CRO um, on a product page is going to be, first thing I would look at is don't run crazy sales. Don't be like, it used to be 10 grand, but now it's a buck. <laughs> you know, so Google will actually start to start to give you misrepresentation suspension policies because of that. But social proof is huge. Make sure you have as many reviews as possible and keep them right underneath the product description and, and images and price. So make sure that you're using um make sure you're using the the social proof a big thing this is something that we're going to be covering in the master class is i'm going to kind of give you a, a sneak peek of what the strategy is run chat but only run chat on the checkout page and you only run chat on the checkout page 30 seconds after inactivity uh, so what uh, or there's another rule 30 seconds of inactivity or over two minutes. The reason being is that on the checkout page is that point where they buy or they, they don't essentially. And average 63% abandoned rate, card abandoned rate. 63% of people will put something in, that, in their cart and then leave. And that's actually getting higher because people are getting smarter and they go, oh, I put it in the cart and I leave and they'll ship me a $10 coupon in my email. Um, so running chat on the checkout page uh, after 30 seconds of inactivity or just over two minutes, it's a rule that you can kind of baby test. Uh, when you're running chat on that page, that's where you can overcome a lot of objections that you don't have to bog yourself down with just random people coming to the site and be like, is this purple or blue? It looks weird. You know, you don't want to have those people. You want to run chat only on specific pages. So a big CRO thing that we've seen a, a huge conversion lift. I mean, sometimes 30, 40% of our conversions is because we put checkout on that chat, or sorry, sorry, chat on that checkout page. Because then you get people saying like, what if it doesn't fit? Can I return it? How much does it cost? Does it give you store credit? Do you give me refunds? What's the shipping time? Um, how do I know those items in stock? You know, all the other things like that. You get those, you get those people that are like, I'm about to pay you money, but I just don't know because of this. And then take all those pieces of information and then put that back on your product pages. So catalog all those conversations that you have because you're going to find out that the catalog, cataloging of those conversations, when you turn that into content, you get a lower card abandonment rate because people are saying like, oh, I got my questions answered, or majority of them, and I'm safe to check out. Um, multiple custom imagery, that's huge. Using stock photos is okay, 
But if you can mix custom imagery with lifestyle images, it has a better effect. Um, it's kind of like think of like a car dealership. When you car dealerships, they use stock photos on our website, but then they also use custom photos of the actual car itself. And then when they get there, the test drive, what they see is they see a lifestyle image of themselves driving the vehicle because it's like, this is what I could do if I buy this car. Same kind of mindset goes into custom imagery of lifestyle images on your product page because it's, oh, you know, it's a person sitting next to a pool with a Bluetooth speaker and you're selling a Bluetooth speaker. It's like, yeah, that could be me. This summer, I could be sitting by my pool with a Bluetooth speaker. Works a lot better than just an image of a Bluetooth speaker, as an example. Custom imagery, don't discount it. It works really, really well. Videos, videos are really, really great. It keeps people engaged. Also sends signals back to Google on landing page experience. Landing page experience score grows because people are taking more time on your site. And that gives you a better quality score. It gives you better cost per click, which gives you better position for lower money. So that in and of itself has a big kind of feedback loop into Google when you use, when you use video. So if you can um, use some custom video or create a video yourself, even if it's just like a cell phone video, um, that's good there. Or if you have any sort of influencers that are possibly marketing the same product, use their video if you can. You know, I'll probably email them, ask them permission, probably will say no, but who knows? Um, use your own discretion there. I've, I've done that a few times. But video on the page is really, really good. Um, the other thing too is the quad payment options, Affirm, uh, I forget, I think there's a few other ones. Those have actually helped increase a ton. Uh, we had one campaign go from eight grand a month up to 15 grand a month because they added a four payment option uh, integration into their site and all of a sudden their sales went really high. So if you have products that are over hundred dollars and they see, yeah, you could break it into four monthly payments of $25, you'll still make your money immediately from that payment processor, but then they have to pay back the payment processor and four monthly payments. But that has seen a very large, significant increase in conversion rates. So those quad payment options, um, those are really good, like a firm. That is something that I would say, you know, test that if you have products that are over $100. Um, one click upsell, I like one click upsell. Um, sometimes it's a little buggy to set up, but I, I really like it. Um, that's something that, you know, can help uh, increase car value. But in terms of uh, on site conversion, be very descriptive. So descriptions on the page is a lot better than like, you know, leather chair like very comfortable, like have some good descriptions. It'll really help your DSA campaign as well um, because it's going to read the content. It's going to match you for more search terms. But um, so use custom imagery. Don't do crazy discounts on price. Run chat on the checkout page after 30 seconds of inactivity or, or over two minutes. Um, use video if you can. Be very descriptive about your uh, descriptions and, and keep your title just obviously really relevant. But social proof is going to be king. Anytime that you can import an Instagram feed of people using your product, uh, anytime that you can run reviews or show reviews. Um, if you go on the homepage of our website, you're going to see a review widget in there of all the review reviews. We have a five-star rating on Google uh, Google My Business right now, which is impossible for an agency to get a five-star rating. It's all, look at any agency, you'll never find a rating as good as ours. So we we, sh we put that top dead center. It's like, hey, if you work with us, you're going to be just like every other happy customer. So social proof is probably the biggest thing that I would put on there. Uh, after your suggestion, I started running, I started a smart shopping campaign without a tart ROAS limit. First two day, no sales slowly picking up and got a 516% ROAS till yesterday. Today, no sale. What would you suggest? Good. 516%. Ah, I love that. That's a lot better than the 3X Shopify. We should call it 5X Shopify. <laughs> um, but what I would do is Google actually has a eight to 20 hour lag. So just because you didn't make a sale today, Google ads, actually, if you if you look at this, don't count today, um, even don't count yesterday or possibly even the day before. The reason is, is because you're gonna find a couple of things. One is gonna be the time to sale. You might spend a bunch of money today and those people all might buy tomorrow and the next day. If you're looking at the conversion column, and I have a video about this, it's called removing conversion lag. If you look at the conversion column, column the column is gonna show you the conversions based on when the click occurred. So if three days ago someone clicked, and then bought today, it's gonna to show up three days ago. It's gonna say, yeah, the people that clicked three days ago and bought today, three days ago are gonna go, whoop, it's gonna look better. So you may not have any conversions today, that's okay, because even if you got a sale right now, today, like in this minute, like in 10 seconds, it probably won't show up till eight o'clock tonight at, or possibly even tomorrow at like 9 a.m. So just cause I, whenever I look at a campaign performance, I ignore the last three days and I, I look back any time period I want up till three days ago. I don't look at the last three days at all because either the sale hasn't happened yet, the click happened before that, or it just hasn't reported on it yet. Um, check out the video of uh, removing conversion lag because that's gonna share with you how to look at the conversions based on when the click occurred. 
versus the conversion based on when the conversion occurred. There's two different columns in Google Ads for conversions, conversions and conversion by, conver or by time and conversion value and then conversion value by time. Um, so those columns you're going to identify um, and that video will help you identify what is my time lag and when should I wait before I make any changes. And if you look at like the last five days, your conversion by conversion time and conversion by click is going to be vastly dis different, sometimes by 100%. It's like, oh, I made two sales. No, I actually made four. That Watch that video. It's like 10 minutes long. It's a little bit complicated, but you'll see your time lag and then you'll see when does when do I start making changes. But my opinion, run 45 to 60 days without a ROAS goal. You're going to see some wonkiness. It's going to some we've had campaigns where I had one day where I didn't even get an impression or a click a week into it. And I'm like, what happened there? They're like no impressions, no clicks. And all of a sudden, next day, boop, pop right back up. So you're going to see some oddities in the first 45 to 60 days. Don't panic. It's going to look a little funky. Just give it time. I promise you it's going to be worth it. But 516% ROAS, awesome. That's awesome, man. Uh, increase the budget? Not yet. It depends. I wouldn't start to really increase the budget till about day 45, day 60. Uh, unless you're spending like $10 a day, then yeah, bump it up a little bit. But don't start to go a little crazy because all of a sudden that ROAS is going to dip really hard. It's going to start to learn the next level up. So you got to give it kind of that next 45 to 60 days. So um, it's going to work the best when you start to increase after the 45 to 60 day mark. Uh, Alvin, when we run smart shopping campaigns 45 days, can we add new products during learn learning period? Yes. Uh, you can add. It used to throw it off a lot. There's a risk. Here's the risk. If you add a new product and that product is super popular and really competitive, it's going to eat up all your budget really, really quickly. You may not earn that sale. But if you add a new product and like, you know, semi-popular and there's some clicks and some impressions, you should be safe. But if if there's like a fad product that you're adding that has all of a sudden yesterday, like a TikTok video came out that went viral and everyone's going to Google and searching for it and you add that product, it's going to go and it's going to shoot all of the budget to that product because it has a ton of inbound search or a ton of people that are like rushing to the, to the internet and looking for it. But just if you don't earn that conversion, your campaign is going to just going to tank um, because maybe someone else is selling it for like one third of your price. And then all of a sudden you're wondering why your campaign spending a ton and you're not making any sales. So just understand how competitive and how popular that product is before adding it, because that's how it's going to affect it. You're going to get the clicks. You're going to get the impressions. Will you get the sales depending upon the competitiveness of that product? So just be wary of that. Davey. Uh, so situation when our agency increased budget for Google Display Network, YouTube, et cetera, while running smart shopping and everything dropped is usual. Um, well, when you say everything dropped, uh, if you're talking about smart shopping dropped as well, yes, because what happened is you're going to, uh, usually when I run, you know, GDN, so a DSK display, a DSK YouTube, I run them in a small amount because what you, what smart shopping is going to say is, wow, there's a ton of new people here. Go after them. They're all brand new to the website and they are interested and ready to buy. But those are top of funnel networks. They're not ready yet. So when you add them, I usually add them small and then start to incrementally increase so that I don't take half my remarketing audience and just throw it out the window that I've been cultivating and say, but there's brand new people here. Let's go after them. And they're not ready to buy. So yes, you will see everything drop. Um, it's not it's not a guaranteed. It is common. And that would be the reason, but I would say it's not guaranteed. You can add a uh, really high level YouTube campaign and all of a sudden just, whoosh, just takes off like a rocket, but it's not the norm. If you add a uh, display and, and YouTube, smart shopping is going to go after those people. So if those people are like, oh, that's a cool video. Who are they? I, you know, and then they look at your website like, oh, that's awesome. Smart shopping is going to start attacking them with, with marketing ads. And if they're like, yeah, was that, that was a really cool video that you guys made. I'm not really ready to buy. Um, smart shopping is just not going to convert those people. So start it in small, wean it into a bigger campaign, but check out your smart shopping campaign because all of a sudden your impressions are going to shoot to the roof, but if your sales don't as well, pull back or turn off those campaigns or add a ROAS goal, you're going to have to test some things. I can't give you you know, a, a one thing that's going to fix that, unfortunately. Some things you can try. Re greatly reduce the smart shopping, or sorry, greatly reduce the DSK and, uh, or sorry, greatly re reduce any GDN campaigns or instill a ROAS goal in smart shopping so it just kind of ignores all the people that it doesn't think are ready to buy yet. Test both those. Bohan, John, can't you exclude Gmail using native placements so you don't get those false clicks? Um, I haven't been successful with that. And I've added 93,000 um, negative placements. Uh, I have a list. I actually paid for a list. Um, and so actually the list came from uh, Ed Leak, God Tier Ads. Mm, awesome, 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 awesome person. Um, we added his 93,000. Uh, it's, it's YouTube, it's websites, it's apps. Uh, huge uh, negative placements list, um, and <laughs> we still get those clicks. Uh, I even had a Gmail uh, negative placement, still gets those clicks. I don't know why. 
Um, so I always lean on automated bidding strategies rather than target exclusions, because if my automated bidding strategy says, well, if I'm using, let's say target CPA or um, target ROAS as an example, it's going to start to greatly ignore those GMO placements that don't get those conversions, but still got those clicks. And if I can't block them with negative placements, I'll block it with a bidding strategy that says, just stop showing them if it's not getting results and it'll wean yourself off of those. Uh, Mike here, awesome, thank you. Uh, I went to Link Merchant Center with Shopify and was immediately banned. Could it be because I don't have any items marked in stock, new store? Uh, no, usually, and Mike, can you let me know what the what the ban reason was? They'll give you a reason, like misrepresentation, um, circumventing strategies, something like that. Can you give me the, the suspension reason? And I'll help kind of guide you through that. Uh, Davey, uh, yeah, conversion sales, yeah. So I would say, and then uh, what do you do when your campaigns hit the ceiling? Well, Davey, are you using a ROAS goal when you hit the ceiling? Please let me know if you're using a smart shopping, if you're at a target ROAS goal when you hit the ceiling. Let me know if that is. Uh, oh, circumventing. Mike, is this your first Google Merchant Center account? Um, usually what circumventing system was like three years ago, I got banned. Uh, and so I started a new Google Merchant Center. Uh, I'm not saying that happened to you, but that's normally what it is. And sometimes it's a bad agency that got you banned and they're like, I'm sorry, sir. And they just, they, they fire you and then you try to go do it yourself and it gives you circumventing systems. Um, so please let me know if that, if it's just your first campaign or not. Um, then we'll get back to that. Uh, oh, and then, oh, I had another account, different email, get banned, but didn't use Merchant Center. Yeah, I would say that that's probably it. Um, I know that you didn't use Merchant Center, but um, a, if a different email got banned, Google is scary. I mean, when I tell you they know who you are, there's no getting around that. They blueprint your computer. They know the RAM manufacturer. Um, they know your processing speed. Like they blueprint all your devices to that person. Uh, it's a way for them to count like cross device conversions. But uh, if you've ever been banned before, I, I, this is gonna be a long conversation um, but that we don't have time for today, but you're gonna need to get into that older account and get unbanned anywhere. Because if it's the same credit card, the same address, the same computer, the same IP address, the same leased IP address, the same Wi-Fi connection, the same mobile device you've ever logged into, they literally know everything. Um, so if you've ever been banned and they try to start something else, even though it's not applicably, uh, directly applicable to what you were banned for, or even the same, you know, I got banned from Merch Center, I got banned from you know, Search Council, Google Ads, whatever it is, they're just gonna outright ban you. Um, so you have to go back into the old account that was banned and work through that ban first before they're ever gonna let you allow you to do anything else, unfortunately, and that circumventing systems, basically we ban them and you try to just do it again. So he's trying to circumvent our ban. That's what that means. Um, all right, what things to take care of when running weight loss ads on Google is weight loss a restricted category. Can I show before and after results on landing pages? Yes, just you're actually might gonna get um, uh, an adult content issue if you have a person in a bikini. Usually you won't. Um, I got, I got uh, an ad disapproved because someone was in a yoga outfit uh, running with headphones and I was trying to sell the headphones and we got we got an ad disapproval, but uh, those are really easy. Usually you can just choose a different image that kind of looks the same and usually you'll get, you'll get, um, you'll get appeal or just appeal that, uh, that, um, that disapproval and you should be able to get it right back up and running. Uh, so that, that's what I'd recommend. Um, but other than that, you know, weight loss things, totally fine. It's not like Facebook. Facebook is really like, you know, body shaming. YouTube, Google is not really like that. You just can't use nudity. So, um, but sometimes they see a lot of skin, they think it's nudity and the automated disapproval will come in, uh, just appeal that. And then usually a manual person will come and say, oh, that's a bikini. Yeah, you're fine. Uh, and they'll be, they'll be okay. Uh, what should we not promise in ads uh, or landing pages copy? Um, not really a lot. You couldn't say best, like, 10 years ago, you couldn't say like the best or number one. Now they really don't care. Um, you're you're okay. You can't use any ban ban rule uh, ban terms. So you know, for weight loss, can't be like better than steroids. Google's just gonna say, oh, he said better than he said. You know, steroids. You're you're suspended. So you can't use any ban words. I can't tell you what the ban words are um, because there's like a thousand of them. But um, the only thing you're gonna get into is like FDA claims. Like can't say like cures cancer. <laughs> Google will, will will ban you for that because obviously there is no cure, and then your my, FDA might come after you. But um, just be honest really um scammy people see right through it so just be be honest just use a lot of testimonials and imagery if you can because that's going to sell um the words are not really that that crazy important uh from google's perspective um okay so davy what do you do when you hit the ceiling yeah um oh yeah so davy uh max conversions oh so you're not running a target row as gold davy uh are there any actions by which you could tell 
that agency is in unfair. Um, I'm not sure what what do you mean, Davey? Can are there any actions by which you can tell that agency in unfair? Can I'm so sorry. Could you could you elaborate a little bit? Um, I'm gonna hop back over to Mike. Uh, yeah, Mike. Might need to discuss more with you since I bought the masterclass. Okay, Mike. Yeah, uh, that's gonna be something that we'll we'll work through. Um, it's yeah, it's a uh, it's a big pain. Um, we might we might have to work at this a couple weeks. No lie. Um, a lot of times, if someone hires us um, and said, "Hey, I've been." have been suspended. Our, our promise to them is we're going to try, but there's really no guarantees um, just because it's it's up to the mercy of Google. I actually had a person, no lie, move. He actually moved. Uh, he moved houses. He got a new phone. He got a new laptop and he moved houses because he had he got suspended. And that was the only way for us to not actually get him unsuspended. And he was running 10 grand a day. So, his <laughs> you know, he was he was OK moving because it was his livelihood. Um, but it actually came, came down to that. Not saying that that happened. That's the craziest story I have. So it's not the norm, obviously. Um, but he actually physically moved his house. Uh, so they had a new IP address, a new location, literally everything he moved. Um, but it worked. Uh, and then he would actually, I'd hop on a screen share and he would look at his campaigns through my screen share. Uh, that's how he had to keep an eye on his campaigns because <laughs> I'm like, just don't log in. We had to use new credit cards, everything. So, um, we'll, we'll work through it with you, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's insane. Uh, okay. Uh, info I SK, how much percentage of a product price is normal for ads spending budget? We have over 12 to 16% is that okay? Margins 20% is, uh, it is hard to get profitable. How much of a percentage of product price is normal for us? Say how much percentage of a product price is normal for ad spend budget? Um, we have over, I'm guessing profitability is your, are you saying margins? Um, Okay, margin is 20%, 12 to 16. And sorry, can you elaborate? I just want to make sure I'm getting the right right information. Um, how much percentage of product price is normal for ad spend budget? Well, I mean, ad spend budget is is daily budget for all of your products. I'm not at uh, a, a total product price. Um, How much percentage of a product price? Can you give me a, a scenario? I'll, I'll stay a little while longer if you want to write it out. I just want to I want to make sure I have the scenario right. So you're saying like if I have X and I do Y, is Z right? Um, can you give me a scenario? If you have 20% margin, I mean, you're going to need at least 500% ROAS uh, just to break even. Um, so that's that that scares me a little bit right now for paid traffic just because if you have to sell a $10 item for less than $2 to make a profit, that gets a little worrisome. Um, average car value is gonna be huge, but can you uh, can you just give me a small scenario just so I can make sure I'm I'm right uh, right in and giving you uh, uh, just right now if you need over 800 ROAS that's gonna be tough gonna be gonna be completely honest with you it's gonna be tough um, 800 ROAS on Google Ads usually takes we have campaigns at 800 ROAS but like after three to six months um, because that's when you just tweak every single thing you're squeezing blood from a stone basically oh okay here we go uh, oh no I thought that was someone else uh, um, um, if you need 800 ROAS, definitely give it a shot. I have a 1600% ROAS campaign for years, um, but they have a product uh, price of $375. For product prices like under 200 or under 100, that's going to be tough. Um, so uh, I would just say that be careful. Maybe only run the products that are at the highest product price that you can, so that when you spend you know, the $35 that is to sell, you sell a $350 product and then bam, 1,000 ROAS. But <clears throat> lower price products, with lower margin, very, 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 very difficult. Just to let you know that. Um, you think about cost per click is let's say a dollar and you take three clicks to sell, that's a 33% conversion rate. But if it's a $10 item, you lost money. So that's the part where you get an amazing conversion rate and you still lose your dollar. So just, just be careful with that. Uh, are there any actions by which agency can slow Smart shopping development. Our uh, ours was increasing and decreasing smart shopping's budget every few days. In my opinion, no. Uh, the way that you can slow the smart shopping development is keeping it on low spend for a long time. Anytime you increase or decrease it, you're basically adding new people to market to, then throwing them back out the window. So every single time, think about your your daily budget is is audience size, and audience size takes time to cultivate. If you decrease that, audience size shrinks. And then you increase it, you put new people in there. And then you decrease it, you throw those people out. And then you increase and you put new people in there. So all you're really doing is just basically running ads to brand new people that you're going to remove soon uh, that are possibly getting ready to buy. So it's not going to be effective. Keep it on a standard ad spend. Keep it low. Cultivate it a long time. You know, $20 a day and run it for a year. 
uh, that's going to be a lot better than going like 20 and the 50 and the 20 and the 50. So just make sure that just think about your daily ad spend as your audience size. That's how you have to think about it. Uh, people take time to buy. <clears throat> do you guys ever do an um, n-gram analysis to evaluate the performance of two, three, four, five, etc. word phrases as opposed to just analyzing complete keywords? Well, uh, I have not. We used to do keyword sculpting. Uh, we used to use a lot of and keyword sculpting. So negative keywords in one ad group that are, uh, so exact, let's just say you have an exact match key phrase in one ad group and you have a broad match modified of another one, you would add the exact match key phrase as a negative to the broad match modified and then vice versa. Um, I, but since Google, it started to ignore match types. I, I don't, I don't do it anymore just because I have things I'm like, I need to have this key phrase and it's like, yes, but since that key phrase isn't as popular as all the other ones, we just got you an exact match close variant. Um, so now it just ignores that. I even had some ignoring my my negative keywords. Keyword sculpting actually restrict. Remember that key that I think that campaign with like ninety thousand keywords. <clears throat> we did that for a decade, um, and I had ninety three thousand keywords. I could tell you every single way someone possibly searched, uh, except for when I ran broad, and then I was like, oh, I was wrong. There was more than ninety three thousand. So my opinion is, I can I can take ten broad keywords and get ten times the results than it would take me ten years with keyword sculpting and and running um, different different match types, only because Google now completely ignores match types. And so I, I just don't rely on it anymore. I, I will hit my ceiling after after finally finding all those key phrases, doing keyword sculpting and, and identifying those. Um, I will then say, great, my, now my search brush share is 91% and I'm only $100 a day, I can't scale. So scalability, since I work for agencies, or since I'm an agency, I work for my clients. The client's like, here's 20 grand, spend 20 grand or you're fired. I can't use those traditional, um, I can't use those traditional ways anymore because I, work for the client. If I was doing it myself, I would probably take a little bit different different of, a, of an approach um, the way that you're doing. But since I get paid to do what they want, essentially, I have to make sure that I hit those numbers. So I can't use the traditional ones because if I do, and then I also have my match types ignored, then the client's not happy. So uh, I have to adapt. And so that's why I use more broad. Uh, let's see. Oh, I think... Uh, we go. Uh, when the campaigns stopped for a week and restarted, would the data gathered just continue or restart learning? And how much do you charge to run Google Ads, uh, Virginia? So Google has a two-day rule. Google says it stops learning after two days. We usually GTIN uh, helps that pick back up faster. But yeah, we have had campaigns where we stopped it for a week and then it takes another, like no joke, two weeks to a month to come back into full swing. Usually if products have GTIN, it gets there much faster because Google has a better way of cataloging them. Uh, our we charge $1,500 per month plus 10% of the ad spend to run uh, Google Ads campaign. So if you're spending five grand a month, you're going to pay us $1,500 plus 10% of that five grand. So it'll be another 500 bucks. So our total charge would be $2,000 a month to run a $5,000 per month campaign. And if you're spending 10 grand, our price is 2,500 because 1,500 plus 10% of 10 grand. So that's how that works. Uh, for you, hopefully that's, that's answers your question. Oh, uh, campaign stop due to click C zap that Google flag as malicious software suggested by the agency now removed interesting we've used clicksies for a while and never had a usually the malicious software wasn't necessarily the clicksies app because that's connected to the google ads campaign um it is on the uh, on the site though but that's that's really interesting that they uh that they removed that we usually only use clicksies when your invalid click rate and your invalid clicks are higher than like 15 and 20 percent if it's not at that level um where google's capturing a bunch we usually don't even it's still clicksies so that's that's really interesting but um if you're running, uh, Virginia, if it's e-commerce, GTIN is going to get you there faster. If you're running lead generation, possibly look to switch back to manual uh, um, if you don't see the campaigns come back very quickly. <clears throat> uh, Davey, uh, thanks, John. God bless America. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, Sam, seriously, this channel is the best I have found on YouTube when it comes to paid traffic knowledge. The only thing is I found it late. I, got your, uh, I get your point immediately. <laughs> but Cosmo speaks really fast. Please tell them to slow down. <laughs> <Will> they, <laughs> I, this is me on half speed, by the way. <laughs> uh, I think I taught Cosmo to speak too quickly. Uh, info. Uh, so should I throw away all low price products and below 500 ROAS from shopping feed? Is it a waste of time anyway? No. First, test it because you're, you're, you're low. I have $5 items that have $100 average card value because they come to the site for that low price, but then they buy a bunch of other stuff. So test it first. If you find that the lower price product is selling and the only product that's selling, so it means your average cart value for a sale of that product is basically that product price, then you have to remove it if it's spending a whole bunch of money. 
But if it's a, I have a mask, a, a cloth mask that has a hundred dollar average cost per, per or average value per sale because they come for the mask and they're like, oh, I need the mask. And then like this, this, and this. Um, and then all of a sudden I've spent, you know, 50 cents to bring that person on or a dollar to spend, spend, send that person in, into my website for a $5 mask, but then they buy a hundred dollar products. Great return on investment. So test first. Another thing I would say, add similar products to your, your, um, to your, uh, your pages. <clears throat> That's not necessarily CRO recommendation is going to help cart value. And there's apps in Shopify, if you're on Shopify that allow you to use other different types of products. So what that means is that if you place a, a widget on the page that when they get to that product page, it says people also buy this. And so that can help increase your average cart value. That's what I would recommend. Uh, I injected the code in the website itself. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah. <clears throat> if you injected the code in the website, um, I haven't run into that issue. Um, and sometimes I would actually just reach out to, to Google and just say, Hey, you know, it's clicksies. What's the problem? Um, that might be, that might be something that, that could get around that. I don't, I, I don't lean on clicksies. I've actually had some campaigns actually perform less from clicksies because VPN traffic was good for them because they didn't have international traffic. So that was just kind of a weird byproduct that happened there. Um, but, yeah, if it's if it was uh, you know invalid software and it was Clixies, then yeah, that makes total sense. Uh, a liquid file, yeah, okay, um, yeah. If it was in liquid, you should be fine. That's that's very odd. I've started to happen to you. I've never actually heard that happen before. And we've used like Lucky Orange, Hot Jar, Clixies, you know, all of them. <laughs> you name it. And call tracking metrics, call rails, literally everything. Uh, OctaChat, Live Chat, whatever it may be. Um, I never had that issue. Um, so I'm sorry that happened to you. That's really, really, really odd. I wonder if it was something com combating with your um, with your theme. Um, so that's, that's definitely is, is something that's more unique. I haven't heard that before. So sorry to hear about that, but, um, yeah, flag is malicious software. Yeah, that's, that's really strange. Um, I've had some clients get flagged for malicious software, but that was because they were running a free trial of a SaaS product and Google just didn't know what it was. And you can actually download the SaaS file right from the website. So Google's like, Hey, we don't know what this is. So we're not going to drive pay traffic to this thing because people are downloading, a you know, a, a software that we haven't checked. So malicious and they just banned it. So. Um, that's crazy though, but, um, yeah. Okay. Uh, oh, I think we got through it. <laughs> I have a call starting in four minutes, uh, and I have to go use the restroom because I drink a lot of water. Uh, but thank you so much everyone for, for joining. And then, uh, you know, we'll be back here next week on Monday. Um, and let's see if we can, uh, yeah, see if we can, we can help more. I think it was there anything, uh, and Michael Johnson, let me know if that answer for you makes sense. I'm even happy to you hop on a call and kind of share with you some of the other campaigns that are running with more pure broad and their previous, you know, really crazy. We had negative keyword lists that were you know, over a thousand keywords long applied specifically to only campaigns that are running certain match type, like every ninja trick in the book, we've tried it. Um, and I'm kind of upset that pure broad was just winning my, my like decade of hard work. So yeah, it was, uh, it was hard to let go and it was immensely hard to convince clients, you know, these five keywords will work better than these hundred that you've been cultivating for two years. Like, I don't believe you. Uh, so yeah, unfortunately, Google just knows more than, than I do instead of Google Ads, which is not a big shocker. They built built the thing. So, um, yeah, let me know if that helped. And then let's just see here. Um, John, you missed my question at 2012. Please check it out. Let me just see. Uh, I don't see a question from you. Jordan, can you? I'm literally looking at all of the chat. Uh, it didn't come through for me. I can go all the way up to the top. Can you retype it here? I got four minutes. Go ahead and, and, and see if you can paste it again. If you can find it in the chat, paste it again, I'll, I'll answer. Uh, thanks, John. We'll connect with you about the band account. Thanks, Mike. <clears throat> and Jordan, um, yeah, see if you drop it in here real quick. I'll see if I can answer before my call. We're on a time crunch. Yeah, Jordan, let me see. Um, hey, John, sorry I missed uh, the start, 3.20 a.m. here. I have a quick question. Sure, Glenn, see if you can shoot it real quick. I got about two minutes left. And I got Jordan that's going to be pasting his uh, his question here. Hopefully he's on slow chat mode. I can control F for it. Yeah, you already even control F only finds your name once. I'm so sorry. I didn't see the, the chat didn't come through on my side. Um, okay. Uh, any suggestions regarding running uh, addiction services campaigns in India? It's restricted category. Yeah, we lost three clients from that. 
The only way uh, we lost three addiction treatment specialist clients as soon as Google rolled through and just said, nope, um, we haven't gotten back. The, those three clients are just lost now for us. Only thing is, um, if you can work with Ben Verified, but not Ben Ben Verified, she's a legit script, L E G I T S C R I P T, legit script. They can get you back and verified for running those um, those type of campaigns. So contact legit script it might be three, four grand to get approved, but it just wasn't worth it for us because um, I just didn't like the client that we were working with at the time anyway. So it was okay. Um, let's see, uh, Glenn using Target CPA. I have heard you. I have heard you should have your budget at 10 to 15 times your target CPA, your thoughts. No, I, I don't use rules like that. Um, I, I use a target CPA and budget just, you know, kind of together side by side, depending upon volume. And I work with all of so my clients, so my clients say, Hey, I, you, you got five grand, spend it as much as you want, but I need 500% ROAS. Um, so, I don't use those rules at all. Um, your product and my product are gonna be totally different. If I sell a ten thousand dollar item, you sell a one dollar item. That doesn't make sense, does it? So a lot of things are gonna have to come into play. I just I can't I can't lean on a rule like that. I, I no, that just seems like someone possibly you know adding a rule to add a rule. But I I wouldn't I wouldn't agree to that. Uh, it's really it's really situational. Uh, hey John, do you start the smart shopping campaign right off the bat or get some converted data with regular campaigns first? Run everything first. Run a smart shopping campaign along with a standard shopping campaign, a search, a DSA, a DS, uh, sorry, a DSK YouTube, DSK display. Um, run a competitive campaign, a remarketing campaign. Uh, run everything alongside of smart shopping. All of those will teach smart shopping what your customers look like, your traffic look like, and how they buy. Run everything alongside of a smart shopping campaign at the same time. Don't start with a target return ad spend. Um, Davey, always feeling fresh after those Q&A sessions. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Jordan, I didn't see your question come through again. I don't know why it's not it's not coming through, but if you can, I got to get going. But uh, come back next Monday and we'll go through it. Thank you so much, everyone. I really appreciate it. Bye.